Let's pray together, friends. <clears throat> Father, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Help us now as we gaze upon the beauty of your being in the pages of your word that the Holy Spirit would illuminate our minds and come and warm our hearts, increase our affections for the Lord Jesus. And we pray this in his good name. Amen. Amen. Well, this is the first, or the second rather, uh, uh, sermon in this uh, little Advent series that we're doing. Uh, Brother Deuce will preach uh, next week on the 17th, so you're in for a real treat. Um, my wife and I are actually getting away for a few days uh, by ourselves, so um, praise God. Um, when it's uh, with your kids, it's an outing. When it's just you and your spouse, it's a vacation. Uh, so we plan on doing a lot of exciting things like sleeping. Um, but I uh, hope to be, be tuning in from a distance. I'll be back for Christmas Eve uh, as we look at Galatians 4, and then we're going to look at the second advent in Revelation 22 on the 31st, Lord willing. Today, we're in this famous passage called the Magnificat which uh, comes from this word magnify in Latin, the Magnificat. It's the first of about four nativity songs uh, during uh, the, the Advent season as Luke opens up his gospel. And this song is really rich, isn't it? Um, some amazing theology that is poured into this particular song, and we appreciate that because we like lyrically rich songs at Imago Dei. Uh, we, we try to avoid the uh, more fluffy songs uh, that Mike Bird says goes like this. Jesus, Jesus, you're terrific. For you, I'd swim the Pacific. Yeah, baby, yeah, baby, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a line from, uh, from Dr. Bird. Only they're not that deep. Uh, but a lot of those are floating around today. And a lot of Christmas songs are really filled with awesome theology. But you also have some that are kind of lullaby sounding and, you know, very sentimental and so on. Um, but, but this is a great song for us to consider for its uh, truth and its, and its depth. And I would say if you're in this room this morning and you're not a Christian, we're really glad that you're here. Hope you come back. Um, this is a good text for you to consider as well, um, because as one writer says, uh, this is Mary on the Christian life. Uh, she really hits some really important themes for, wh for what it means to live out the Christian uh, faith. Now, I would also add, if you're a teenager in the room, this is especially significant for you, because Mary is, believe it or not, a teenager. Uh, you can follow Jesus, love Jesus at a young age, students. You don't have to wait. And so if you're looking for role models, and God knows our kids need some, you should prefer Mary to Miley, okay? Um, a a better, better model for you to consider as you think about what it means to, to glorify God with your life. Teenagers struggle with the same heart questions really that all of us struggle with. Questions like, does anyone care about me? Does anyone see me? Will anything satisfy me? Mary answers all those in this one song. She knows God sees her and cares for her. She has found already at a young age that only God will satisfy her soul. She is caught up with the beauty and majesty of God as a teenager. Now, you say, what about me? I'm a senior saint. Well, we are really glad you're here as well. And we've got something for you too. Her name is Elizabeth. Elizabeth, Luke, opens up his book by talking about this lady who is, I love how the ESV puts it, advanced in years. She was advanced in years. And she's this senior saint who was old and barren, and God in his grace visited her, and she is now pregnant. And Mary has been told by the angel about Elizabeth, and so she makes haste to go meet with her. And Elizabeth has this great ministry of encouraging this younger believer. Right. She's a great example as well for those who are older. So there's something for everybody here this morning. Verses 39 to verse 45, we see the context for this song, which is very important, I think. And the context is Mary has just went to visit her, her auntie, her relative, Elizabeth, and she's made this really long journey. This is about 100 miles. Mary, a teenage girl, has made through rugged wasteland. She's a beast of a lady, right, to go 100 miles, um, very Serena Williams-like to, to get to uh, Elizabeth's house, and she remained there, verse 56 says, for about three months, okay? So verse 40 says that she enters the house of Zechariah, that's Elizabeth's husband, uh, and here is this beautiful little scene. 
of two obscure women in this little place that God has met in His grace. A senior citizen and a teenager. This is how the Gospel of Luke opens up. God condescending to the least of these. That's actually the, a big theme, the theme in the Magnificat. That's how God has looked upon those of humble estate. So here they are now. You know they were having a good chat, as ladies do. They're all up by themselves now. No distractions. They're about to be distracted with those kids. But no distractions. And Zechariah was mute. He was made mute because he didn't believe that his wife was going to be uh, pregnant because they were, so, they were so old. And so now Elizabeth, as someone said, has two blessings, a mute husband and a baby. <laughs> and so here they are all left to themselves to uh, interact and to talk and encourage and to sing. And it's a beautiful picture here of God in his grace visiting these two women. Their births, uh, the narratives are very similar in many ways. I mean, it's a miracle for this older saint to conceive. It was a social stigma not to have children. She's left with that, and then God comes and does the impossible. And she's going to have a baby. And what a baby Elizabeth is going to have. Not only is she going to be old with a baby, she's going to be old with baby John the Baptist. Can you imagine? Grizzly Adams walking around. He got a beard by the time he's about six probably. And... (laughs) He's preaching repentance because Jesus is the Son of God. And so the mother of John the forerunner and the mother of Jesus the Messiah are interacting together. And what follows is an explosion of Holy Spirit joy. Verse 41, it says, When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Isn't that cool? Already before he's out, he's made the womb his pulpit. He's already preaching, leaping, doing what he's going to do when Jesus arrives, pointing people to Jesus, exulting in Jesus. Notice it's a baby in the womb, by the way, with emotion, right, with joy. So baby John here is is exploding in joy, and so is Elizabeth as well. Notice verse 42, she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. She is happy. This older saint, blessed are you, Mary. Not because Mary was sinless. We're going to see Mary's song says, you know, she's praising the Savior. She needed to be saved like all of us. But she's blessed because God has met with her, visited her in a miraculous way, and she's trusting God's word. And so Elizabeth is encouraging Mary. There's no jealousy on the part of Elizabeth, just joy. And there's humility that Mary would visit her. Verse 43 It says, and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Who am I that you would come to me? Well, that's the spirit of Luke 1. Humility, awe, wonder, joy. Why? Because that's what grace does to us. It makes us stand in awe. It makes us humble, and it makes us happy. And so unborn John now is, is preaching in the womb, verse 44 When the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now, this is the context of Mary's song. And what follows is this continuation of holy joy. I love how N.T. Wright describes this, New Testament scholar. He says, quote, it's the gospel, the Magnificat. It's the gospel before the gospel. A fierce, bright shout of triumph 30 weeks before Bethlehem, 30 years before Calvary and Easter. It goes with a swing and a clap and a stamp. It's all about God, and it's all about revolution. And it's all because of Jesus. Jesus, who's only just been conceived, not yet born, but who has made Mary giddy with excitement and hope and triumph. In many cultures today, it's the women who really know how to celebrate to sing and dance with their bodies and voices, saying things far deeper than words. And all the men said, amen. That's how Mary's song comes across here. So when we read the Magnificat and the Gospel of Luke, the New Testament opening up with an eruption of joy because the fulfillment has come. And Mary erupts in this time of singing because what God has done must always be sung. And so we see a series of songs here. My friends, this is the spirit of Christmas. 
is really my main point today. And that is, it's a, it, the, the Christmas spirit is this spirit of worship. You often hear this a lot, don't you? Like, are you in the Christmas spirit yet? And what does that mean? Have you decorated yet? Have you watched Christmas Vacation yet? Have you, <laughs> like, have you had the eggnog yet? No, the Christmas spirit is a spirit of worship. Because if you miss Jesus at Christmas, you've really missed it. It's like having a birthday party without the birthday boy being present. Christmas is all about the exaltation of what God has done for us in Christ and all that he has for us in Christ. And so we can learn a lot from Mary's worship here, the Christmas spirit, you might say. There are three aspects of her worship that I think are worthy of our consideration and emulation. First of all, we see here soul-satisfying worship. Secondly, we see Bible-saturated worship. And thirdly, we see God-centered worship. Soul-satisfying. Notice how it begins in verse 46. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. It's wholehearted worship on the part of Mary. She's worshiping with all that she is. Now, question, what would make you celebrate from the depths of your being today? Without inhibition. What kind of news would it take for you to celebrate? And people say, man, what happened to them? Perhaps someone said, you don't have any debt anymore. The cancer is gone. The cancer is gone from your friend, your family. <laughs> what kind of good news would make you rejoice? Because good news makes us rejoice, right? You hear good news, you want to call somebody, you, you might dance a bit, you might weep for joy. You might write a song like Mary, but you're going to do something. The good news of the gospel should cause us to soar in worship. Our soul magnifies God. Many echoes here of the Psalms, I think. Psalm 108, 1, I will sing and make melody with all my being. Psalm 103, 1, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Ephesians 5, 19, I love how Paul puts it. He says, the Spirit comes and fills us, and we can then make melody to the Lord with our hearts. A very encouraging uh, uh, verse for those who have no musical ability and can't sing. You can make melody to the Lord with your heart. And that's what God is looking for. I one time tried to play music. I tried to sing. I actually tried to sing in corporate worship one time. Emphasis on one time. I think I just wanted a guitar because all the ladies like guys with guitars. And Imago Day is proof of that. Like I told my son the other day, I said, man, you want to, you want to get the ladies like you need to learn to play guitar. I was like, have you ever seen Donnie Hollis? You explain that. How that girl married him. It's called a guitar, man, okay? Um, and A-Rod and Manny. It all, it all applies here. Uh, so I, I, was, I was trying. It didn't work, though, and I had no skills. So I think that's also important. Um, I played one time in a worship service. I did three songs in a little Baptist church. And I sat down beside my mother, who was there, who was full of encouragement. And she put her arm around me. And she said, you did your best, honey. You did your best. <laughs> Last time. Last time I sang in public. But I can make melody to the Lord with my heart. And so can you. It's all inclusive here. Notice it's personal. She's singing to her Savior. I rejoice in God, my Savior. I hope you can say that. You found the Savior. Rejoice in the Savior. And it's directed toward God, isn't it? I magnify the Lord. Magnify. Make large. Now, you can't make God bigger. But her view of God, her praise to God is magnified she's praising him for his greatness this also echoes many of the psalms i think psalm 34 3 oh come and magnify the lord with me let us exalt his name together kimberly and i claim that as our our verse before we got married when i proposed to her i said will you come and magnify the lord with me in marriage she said yeah i said amen that made me happy I got, we got that verse carved in our ring, Psalm 34, 3. Come and mag, because that's what life's about, magnifying the Lord. Then I lost the ring in the ocean, had to get a replacement. But anyway, <laughs> we're still trying to do it, though, because this is what life is about, magnifying him. And here's the secret in Mary's song that I think is very important. You notice the parallelism, magnifying and rejoicing, they go together. Joy and giving God glory. 
when you minimize God, you minimize joy. When you maximize God, you maximize joy. Most people don't believe that. They think, if I can just minimize God, not have anything to do with God, then I can really have my fun. I can really have joy. No, you don't. It doesn't work that way. Some of the best news in all the world is your quest for joy and happiness and God's command to glorify him are not at odds. They are together. Because as Piper put it so well, God is glorified in us when we're satisfied in him. And so make much of God, and when you make much of God with your life, you will find joy because they go together. And that's why you see it all through the Psalms, don't you, about joy and praise. They go together. So it's soul-satisfying worship. Secondly, it's Bible-saturated worship. One of the most impressive things about this song is how many allusions to the scriptures that Mary alludes to. And you can point to a number of passages, and it'll be tedious to try to show you all of them, but it's just saturated with the Bible. And it's led some to say, there's no way Mary could write this. She's a teenager. Oh, yeah, she could. She had been taught the Bible in the synagogue with her family. And she would teach her sons. And James and John, by the way, would drop many of these same sort of ideas in their own teaching. Oh, Mary, at a young age, had immersed herself in the scriptures. And you teenagers need to do the same. The most obvious allusion in this song to a text, I think, is 1 Samuel 2 to Hannah. Mary could have been actually thinking about this song, meditating on this song, while she uh, was, was writing it. We have a lovely little chart there, um, as an expression of my love for you. Um, as you see the similarities in these songs, and they're more than just those, those four, but Hannah's story, very similar to Mary's story, she couldn't conceive, she did conceive, and she burst out into praise, right? It was God visiting her in a very important stage in redemptive history. And as a result, she praised God. She exulted in God. The song also, I think, alludes to Psalm 113, where God lifts the needy from the ash heap. He makes the, gives the barren woman a home. And God comes and he visits the humble. I'm sure Mary loved the women of the Bible. I'm sure she loved the stories of Sarah and Deborah and Hannah and Ruth and Abigail. And she loved all of it. There are allusions here to Genesis, Deuteronomy, 1st, 2nd Samuel, Job, Psalms, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Micah, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, all in one song. And there are probably more than that. Now, I think that's very important today because a lot of people don't think kids can learn the Bible or theology. I'm like, please. If they can order from Starbucks, they can study the Bible, Okay. <laughs> Like, let's stop dumbing down things for kids, students, and let's teach them. If they can do chemistry, they can read Luke. So who are we fooling here, right? I tell the students that every year at youth camp, hey, I'm going to treat you like a young adult. And you need to get a Bible and come on and study with the rest of us. Like, it's time to grow up. And do not buy into this myth of prolonged adolescence where you have this, you know, period of life where you absolutely do nothing and waste your life. And I'm talking like a dad, aren't I? But Mary here, and you see it throughout the Bible, the disciples were young, teenagers. Like, if you're a student, learn here. Don't waste your teenage years. You don't know how long you're going to live anyway. Like, start following Jesus now. Be a leader now. Like, why are you going to wait? Do you think there is something better? There's not. Because you're made for God. You're wasting your time and your life. Mary here, the gospel story begins with this teenage peasant girl who is immersed in the Bible. And she writes a song because she loves God. It's a beautiful picture. And I pray that all of our girls and gals, guys and gals, would follow her lead. But we shouldn't just make this a teenage exhortation, should we? All of us need to immerse ourselves in the scriptures. Paul makes this connection in Colossians 3 when he says, As the word dwells in us richly, we sing songs. So if there's no song in our heart, perhaps we've not been meditating on the word. Because worship is a response to God's revelation of himself. And you see him, praise him. So it's Bible-saturated worship. Thirdly, finally, it's God-centered worship. This song has a particular object, namely God. It's not hard to see. You just notice how many times she uses this personal pronoun. He has, he has, he has, he has. This is what God has done. So her focus here is on who God is 
what he's done and what he will do. If you want to summarize it with two A's, it's about God's attributes and God's actions. Who he is and what he's done. Now, this is very important as well because the way we fight self-absorption and anxiety is by turning our attention away from our circumstances to the being and nature and glory of God. I would remind you here that Mary has a lot to worry about. Like giving birth to Jesus, that's a big deal. She's traveling 100 miles, and what's she doing? She's not inward. She's not crushed. We don't find her anxious. What do we find her doing? We find her worshiping. Why? Because her attention, her gaze, is away from self to the greatness of God. The antidote to worry is worship. The antidote to getting our attention off ourselves is to think about who God is and what he's done. And that's what she's doing here. And so let's notice just a few attributes. God is mighty. Verse 49. She thinks about this for a moment. He who is mighty has done great things for me. God has been mighty throughout the centuries. He's displayed this might in a number of ways. And here in Mary's case, he's displaying his might by powerfully bringing forth a virgin birth. This is a reminder to us that the Christmas story shouldn't lull us to sleep. It should awaken us to the power of God, the almightiness of God, the godness of God. We should not despair in our trials. Look at this God. Look what he's doing. Look what he can do. It's very dangerous for us to lose our awe of God. It's very dangerous for us to lose our awe of his might. He has power over the mighty ones on the earth. Notice verse 51 and 2. He's shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. So there's a contrast of God's might and the mighty of the earth. And it's not a contest. He's brought down the mighty because he is almighty. I love Zephaniah 317. The Lord God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. This mighty God has come to save us. And Zephaniah says he loves us. He's singing over us. What a thought that this mighty God has done that. This God is holy. Verse 49, she says here, for he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. God's name refers to his essence, to his character, and his character, his essence is holiness. God is in a category by himself. And when Jesus, uh, his birth is is foretold by the angel, the angels say, he will be called holy, the son of God. That's who he is. But gratefully, the Lord is also merciful, isn't he? Verse 50, his mercy is for those who fear him. Verse 54 as well, he has helped Israel, his servant Israel, in remembrance of his mercy. That is his chesed, his loyal love, his faithful love, his never failing love. What a God. So she thinks about his attributes. We should do the same. She now thinks about his actions. And here's the dominant action, I think, that's going through the Magnificat, and it's this. God lifts the humble, and he humbles the proud. He lifts the humble. Notice verse 49. She says, he who is mighty has done great things for me. This is the summary of of, of Mary's uh, reflection on God's actions. He's done great things for me. We could all say that, couldn't we? He has done great things for me. This is the message of Christmas. It's not good advice to improve your life a little bit. It's good news of what God has done in his grace. He has done great things for us. And Mary says, it's not just me. Notice verse 50. For all who fear him, from generation to generation, she is foreseeing that God is continuing, going to continue to do great things for his people. And the activity that we find here being emphasized is God lifting up the humble, those who fear him, and God humbling the proud, those who think they don't need him. And this is a theme that's going to run right through the gospel of Luke. Luke has a particular interest in how God, in Christ, has a Concern for the marginalized, the weak, the oppressed, the tax collector. He will use that axiom over and over in Luke that those who exalt themselves will be 
humbled, those who humble themselves will be exalted. You're going to see it throughout the Gospel of Luke if you were to read through it. So we should notice then God lifting the humble, verses 46 to 49. This is Mary's own testimony, and then she turns it to everybody who, who fear him. It's their testimony as well, that God lifts the humble. It's not hard to see in the birth narrative God doing this. I mean, who's Mary? She's from a nowhere place. She's a nobody, basically, we would say today. And yet God visits her. And Christ does not come in a limo, does he? Big parade? No, he's born in a feeding trough to a teenage peasant girl. God lifts the humble. You see the testimony of everyone in verse 50 when she turns it and says, for everybody who fears him. So listen, if you want grace, what do you do? You get low. You humble yourself. You fear God. You revere God. You're in awe of God. And God will lift you. I love what Augustine said. He says, for those who want to learn God's ways, humility is the first thing, the second thing, and the third thing. You want to learn God's ways? Want to grow in grace? Humility, humility, humility. Amen. Say it fast for three times. God lifts those who fear him. So anyone can do this in their hearts. doesn't matter where you're from, what race you are. What matters is you bow down before him. He's lifting them. Notice verse 52b. He says, he has exalted those of humble estate. And one of the ways you know if you are a humble individual is that you're a hungry individual. Notice what she adds here in this, in this parallelism. <clears throat> He has filled the hungry with good things. The humble are the hungry. That is, they go to God to be satisfied. But the rich, he's, uh, she says, has turned, uh, he's turned away empty. That is, the, the calloused rich. Those who don't think they need God. They're self-satisfied. And so they're sent away empty, like the rich young ruler. He had too many possessions, had too many idols. And so the call to us here is to be hungry and to go to God to be satisfied. And Jesus says, everybody who comes to me will never be, will never be hungry again. And this is our world, right? Looking for stuff to satisfy them. I'll never forget the first time I came across that line from Piper that I referenced earlier, that God is most glorified in us and we're most satisfied in him. I was uh, thinking and praying whether or not I needed to go into the ministry. I was, I'd been a Christian about two years and I went to the bookstore because I wanted to fast and pray. So I found a book called A Hunger for God. I'd never heard of this author before or this book. And I got it, and I rented a, a house out in the woods. I was going to pray all week and fast and read this book. And I got out in the woods, and I got scared to death. I came back home. Um, <laughs> it is, the woods are just not comforting to me. But um, I did read the book, and I, I did fast. I did uh, go into ministry. Um, and I remember that it like, struck me right in the introduction. That God is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in him. And it struck me so deeply because I was, like everybody else, longing to find contentment, to find joy, to find satisfaction. And also wanted to glorify God with every, <clears throat> every fiber of my being. And to know that these two things are not at odds. But we are satisfied when we glorify him. Amen. We're not satisfied when we don't. You will never find it in power, in, in money in popularity no augustine was right our hearts are restless until they find their rest in god because he's made us for himself to look elsewhere other than god for satisfaction is a fool's errand learn from this teenager that god fills the hungry with good things and be filled be filled and jesus does fill you it's not like a little snack it's deep fulfillment I don't know if you've ever been on an airplane before, but if you've ever been on a long flight, they give you a little pack of peanuts. You're like, what am I going to do with this, man? Like, I'm starving. <clears throat> I got 12 peanuts. I'm going to scatter them all out, going to eat them slowly, and uh, pray that God would, you know, multiply them into 5,000 or something like that. But th that's like what you're doing when you are going somewhere other than God to satisfy the soul. A little pack of peanuts, man. That ain't happening. Christmas can't satisfy you. But Christ can, and he does. God humbles the proud. That's verses 51 to 53 briefly here. Just notice this, this theme in, in these three verses. It's a theme of reversal. It's God, and Mary's already identifying this at a young age, 
how the values of the world and the values of God are different. And it's a theme of reversal. It's like what one of the philosophers, very strange Danish philosophers, Soren Kierkegaard, said, it's as though God went into the department store and changed all the price tags. <clears throat> and Mary's already detected. She sorted it all out. What is valuable? So there's an attitude reversal in verse 51, a social reversal in verse 52, and a fullness reversal in verse 53. Notice the attitude reversal, 51. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. He scattered them. He will scatter those who feel no need for him, who are proud of their attainments and capabilities. He scattered Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, the Philistines. A social reversal in verse 52. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and he's exalted those of a humble estate. This, this song is looking back and looking forward. And as it looks forward, we're reminded that the meek will inherit the earth. That's who will inherit the earth. It will be a, a great reversal as we see how this verse unfolds. 53 is a fullness reversal. He's filled the hungry with good things, but the rich he sent away empty. Now, it doesn't mean if you're rich you can't be satisfied. You can. Again, Mary's thinking of the proud, the self-satisfied, the calloused rich. And so we see in this song that God is giving mercy to those who fear him. The humble receive his mercy. The proud receive his justice. Therefore, my friends, we must stay low. We must stay humble. We must stay hungry. God will humble. He will scatter. He can. He will. Individuals or nations or even churches if they fail to stay low and humble themselves before him. The final action that she notes in verse 54 and 5 is God's faithfulness, that he's fulfilled all his promises. She reflects back on his promise to Abraham that all the nations of the earth through him will be blessed. And we know that Jesus is the great offspring, and through him we are blessed. We are grafted into Abraham's family by faith. Mary's story didn't start with her. It's been echoing from Eden, Genesis 3, that we're waiting on one who will uh, come from the seed of woman who will crush the enemy's head. We've been waiting on one, uh, Isaiah 7, 14, the young virgin who will give birth to a son. And the Christmas story reminds us that God is faithful. God has fulfilled his promises. And because of that, that's put a song in Mary's heart, and it should put a song in our heart as well. Amen. So my friends, this is the Christmas spirit. I pray you have it. One in which you long to magnify the Lord, which you rejoice in God, your Savior that you experience soul-satisfying worship, that as you read the scriptures, you can experience Bible-saturated worship, and as you reflect on the attitudes, the attributes, and the actions of God, you would have God-centered worship. That's what I pray would reverberate through your Christmas season, and indeed to the rest of your life. And the good news is, we can all have this for Christmas. Yeah. I love what Spurgeon says, the Spurge. He concludes his sermon on the Magnificat like this. He says, so then, to conclude, here is something for every child of God to do. You can all magnify the Lord, and you may all rejoice in him. You cannot all preach. If you could, who would be there to hear you? If all were preachers, who would be, where would be the hearers? But you can all praise God. If there is any brother or sister here who has only one talent, let not such a one say, I cannot do anything. You can magnify the Lord. To be happy in him is to praise him. The mere fact of our being happy in the Lord makes music in his ears. Are you happy in the Lord? If you are one of his children, you can be happy in him. So get out of those doleful dumps. Cast out that spirit of murmuring and complaint which so often possesses you. Pray the Lord to help you shake off your natural tendency to look on the dark side of everything. And say, no, no, I must not do that. After all, I'm not on the road to hell. I'm on the way to heaven. Amen. And this world is the waiting room to heaven. So my soul shall magnify the Lord. And my spirit shall rejoice in God my Savior. Amen. May the Lord make us happy in Christ as we magnify him. Even now as we prepare for the table, we're reminded in the Lord's Supper, aren't we, that he has looked upon us in our humble estate. And he has filled us with good things. To him be the glory. Father, we thank you for your word today. I pray you would find us a people who are happy in you. 
glorying in your character, in your work. You have done great things for us, and we are glad. And we pray now as we prepare our hearts for the table that you would use this time as a means of increasing our affections for all that you have done for us in Christ Jesus. May it be a time of examination. May it be a time of rejoicing. And so, Father, we pray you would come and meet with us now as we turn our attention there. In Christ's name, amen.